baby, you are going to go broke showing turkeys like these. Now we're talking turkey. Gobble, gobble, motherfucker. It's turkey time. Gobble, gobble. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Let's Talk Turkeys. I'm Movie Miss, and I'm being joined this week by my co-host, Drive-In Dave. Hello, sir. Hello. So you chose today's film. Uh, It's our second film for Romantic Comedy Month. And I've got to tell you, it was a first-time watch for me. I didn't find it romantic nor funny. (laughs) But I'm curious why you chose this film. Tell everybody what it is, why you chose it, and when you first came to know about this movie and like this movie. Okay, so today's pick, uh, like I said, was mine, is the 2002 comedy Mr. Deeds with Adam Sandler and Winona Ryder. I picked it because I actually like Adam Sandler. I'm one of the people, one of the few, like five people in the world that actually enjoy Adam Sandler films. I came across it when it actually came out. It was like, this was this was about the time that he was hitting, hitting it out of the park with these People call them terrible movies, but I enjoyed them. I, I think he came off of Big Daddy. Uh, this is just before Little Nicky. He's doing like these quote unquote romantic comedies. I agree with you. This is not very romantic, but then I don't find a lot of his movies, except for the ones he does with Drew Barrymore, very romantic. They're just more silly, stupid Adam Sandler funny. Longfellow Deeds is a small town guy. Chuck Cedars. Handshakes are for strangers, pal. We <laughs> hug around here, buddy. What's up? What's up? And he's about to get. When Mr. Blake died, he left an enormous fortune. He left it all to you, Deeds. Forty billion dollars. Holy shit! Just a small town guy. So this is where my uncle lives? Yes, sir. Boy, you kind of snuck up on me there. I am very, very sneaky, sir. This season. I want that guy's life story. I'm all over this. But you should let me go undercover. This could get dangerous. No, he said he likes ladies in distress. One man will teach the big city. There you go. I wouldn't be mugged. Don't worry, I'll get him. Some small town values. Are you okay? I just need to walk it off. Could you? Sure, sure. <laughs> from Columbia Pictures. I met this girl. I think she's the one. I'm from a little town in Iowa. From what part? Winchesterton Field. Money might change his world. Where are you taking me? That's a surprise. Well, Winchesterton Fieldville, Iowa. You gotta be shitting me. But nothing can change his heart. Wow. Woo! Adam Sandler. I got wicked bad frostbite when I was in the scouts. So you could like jump on it and it wouldn't hurt me. I would really rather not, sir. Oh, please, please jump on my foot. No! Oh, you're sick! You're sick! Why would you do that to me? I'm just kidding you, pal. We know the writer. I'm telling him everything. I see why you brought me here. Do you have any idea how much you hurt him? I would do anything to take back what I did to him. I'm sorry. All I heard was blah, blah, blah. I'm a dirty tramp. Mr. Deeds. Put some steam on it, kid. Ooh, that got you right in the throat, huh? (laughs) Gotta ask you, though, if it hits you, is it my point or yours? Well, I'm winning then, I guess. So I am an Adam Sandler fan. We'll get to that later. I had never seen this. It was not on my radar. I had forgotten that it ever even came out. And so I was actually glad you picked it. So it is a turkey. Rotten Tomato critic score of 22%. Audience of 59. Critics, not a big fan of this one. I don't believe he's, aside from his like more serious roles, I don't recall critics really liking any of his movies, to be honest. That probably is right. That probably tracks. If I was to go look up all the scores, you'd probably be right. <laughs> um, directed by Stephen Brill. Uh, you mentioned Little Nicky. He's also the director of that. He also did Adam Sandler movies, Sandy Wexler and Hubie Halloween. Written by Clarence Buddington Kelland, who did a Mr. Deeds TV show. I, I think I've never heard of that. And then he did a short, that was way, it was very old. And then he did a short called Opera Hat Story or something like that, which has to do probably with the original Mr. Deeds, because we also get story credit for Robert Riskin writing the original that this is based on called Mr. Deeds Goes to Town from 1936. Uh, We also have Tim Herlihy, who did Big Daddy, Wedding Singer, Waterboy, Little Nicky, Bedtime Stories, and Pixels. So he's a huge Adam Sandler guy. And I guess he has a cameo in this as a fireman. (laughs) 
<laughs> during the fire scene. Yeah, I was gonna say now I kind of want to go back and like look and see if I could find him. It's like, like which one is he? Yeah. So this film had a budget of fifty million, but like you said, it was when in the during the time when he was hitting hot, he was on his hot streak. So it makes sense that they would throw a bunch of money at him. Box office of $171 million. That surprised me. I didn't to me just because, I mean, like I said, this is this is him at his peak. I think he was at that point where anything he did, people just went to go see it. Uh, that's true. If I look at it that way, he was on a run and people were like, oh, Adam Sandler, we've got to go. That's true. But I would think word of mouth, though, would kind of kill it when people came out and went, you know, it's not the same as his other ones. It's a little different. But people saw it. So they filmed it in New York and Connecticut, which doubles for his New Hampshire hometown. Uh, Hotel shots in Beverly Hills. And then I found out doing trivia that they actually digitally removed the World Trade Center from the film. I couldn't have told you what shot it should have been in anyway, (laughs) because I don't know New York. That's right. I do remember hearing about that. Uh, I completely forgot about that because it was like right after 9-11. Okay, I, that's yeah. you know, that, that's one that completely slipped my mind. Uh, this actually won awards for worst remake at the Yoga Awards, but it won best movie of the summer because it had a summer release. It beat out Scooby Doo, the one that we covered, Men in Black Two, and Austin Powers Gold Member for best movie of the summer. Yeah, what award show was that though? Was that like the Kids Choice Awards? It was like a it was like MTV Movie Awards or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so like, yeah, that that makes sense. Okay, the the Scooby Doo one that's a little hurtful. That kind of pains <laughs> me in the chest. Uh, Men in Black Two, not my favorite Men in Black. Austin Powers Gold Member, that was not a good movie to me. So weakest okay of the three. One. Yeah. Yeah. It did win, as you mentioned, a Kids Choice for favorite actor Adam Sandler for that summer. And two awards for music. I'm not sure if they were, uh, you know, Academy Award for music or, or what. I'm not positive what awards, but two of them for Dave Matthews song, Where Are You Going? I'm not a huge Which, Dave Matthews fan, but I thought that was kind of cool. I, I not a big fan either, but I do like, I mean, there's like maybe two or three songs from Dave Matthews I like, and that is one of them. So I guess my question would be, I'm kind of curious if this was made like four that movie then if this was an original song for the movie because typically if it's something they tack on i want to say they don't usually give it any recognition that could have been like a simultaneous thing where he did it for the movie and put it on his album and it just was a big hit that year kind of thing yeah i I mean this was a good soundtrack i think that's one of the things i really enjoyed about the movie was that the soundtrack was really awesome so top build cast for mr deeds we have adam sandler winona Ryder. John Tuturo, Alan Covert, and Peter Gallagher. And we can get to everybody else as we go. I want to point out, and, and you might uh, you might bring him up too. Um, as far as John Tuturo goes, this was my first ever movie I've seen with him. And over the years, I've come to notice him in a couple other films. I have fallen in love with this man's acting. I mean, I mean, he is like probably the number one reason I enjoy this movie, his character. And I just enjoy this uh, this man's acting so much. Everything I've seen him in is just awesome. That was my note. I was going to say, I got to tell you, the thing that saved this movie for me was John Turturro. Because I have seen him in other things. And he's a delight. I very much enjoy him. He looks different in this film. He feels different. His performance, his character, everything is different from other John Turturro stuff. And I was absolutely in stitches with some of the shit and we'll get to it that he does in this movie. All right. IMDb plot. A sweet natured small town guy inherits a controlling stake in a media conglomerate and begins to do business his way. Does he though? <laughs> it, it, yeah. It kind of feels like they, um, it kind of feels like they didn't really watch the movie. <laughs> right. They read the press kit release, you know, the synopsis that the studio sends out and that was it. I mean, if I was going to redo it, I would probably just like my my synopsis would have been like Adam Sandler does Adam Sandler shit for almost two hours. There you go. Movie right there. (laughs) That's where you and I agree to disagree, because when he's on peak comedy level for me, I find his movies delightful and he's hysterical. I did not find any of the and we'll get to them. The bits in this movie funny. But okay, let's jump in. Our movie opens with whimsical music and title card right off the bat. 
we cut to a man talking to the camera saying he's about to top Mount Everest. And because this was a first time watch, I paused it and I took a good look at him and I wrote in my notes real big. This fucking dude looks 80 years old. What is he doing climbing Everest? And then as soon as I unpause it, words on the screen say Preston Blake, president of Blake Media. And the guy filming him points out he's 82. (laughs) And I went, oh, I just wrote that down. (laughs) It was really funny doing a first time watch because I'm taking my notes as I'm first time watching. And so I'm pausing and writing stuff down and then I unpause and then I get confirmation the whole time. (laughs) So everyone is saying the storm is getting bad and they all leave him alone and abandon him on the top of Mount Everest. And he's like, fuck it. I'm going to continue my climb. We cut to three hours later and we see he is frozen atop the mountain with holding, I don't know what, a flagpole or something, a little flag. And he's frozen smiling. I almost feel like we need to make a drinking game out of the amount of dumb jokes that are in this movie. Because like this is dumb joke number one, essentially, like that joke that just I can picture you not laughing at this. You are correct. I was stone cold deadpan expression going, I guess that's funny. That he froze to death, 82 years old, because <laughs> he's smiling. I don't know. Yeah, this this movie did not hit for me. It did not hit my funny bone. But some stuff like Totoro, like I said, they show footage of him being taken away via helicopter. <laughs> that to me made me giggle a little because I was like, that is not how you do that. <laughs> It's been so long since I saw, like, I, I want to say when I originally saw this movie, I was I was laughing a little harder than I have over the years at it. I think now it's just one of those ones that it's like, it's comfort food. Like, it, it makes me chuckle, and I enjoy the story. That's a pretty, pretty much what it is for me. Okay. So then we see a show called Inside Access, and there's a man on the TV saying that there was no will. Mr. Blake left no will no heirs. Everyone is wondering who is going to inherit this media mogul's $40 billion company. So as soon as he's off the air, he berates who we we don't, this is this, okay, this is part of the problem I have with this movie. We don't know who the players are, what their relationships are, their names, what they're doing. Half of this movie, you just have to go along with it and shit pops up later. Because like right now, he goes in and berates, I wrote in my notes, his assistant. I don't know who this woman is. Calls her babe. It's Winona Ryder in a dark wig. <laughs> a dark long hair wig. Threatens her job and tells her to get, she better get an interview for him from, oh, she needs to get a better interview for him than the dead man's barber. Like that's the best she could do. (laughs) To me, in my notes, like I said, I wrote his assistant. Like, who is this lady? We don't know. I I could see that because that that, that is a little confusing because you don't find out what she really is until later on. So in the beginning, she does kind of come off like the assistant. All you really know about the, you need to know about the other guy is like, okay, he's a reporter and he's a dick. That's it. (laughs) So I absolutely love that actor. It's Jared Harris. I can't off the top of my head tell you other stuff he's been in, but every time oh my, he was in the new Poltergeist, he was in the Poltergeist remake, but anything he pops up in, I'm always like, Ooh, I love that guy, but I can never remember his name. So everybody, yes, Jared Harris, he's fantastic. And he's such a prick in this. You're so right. He's such an ass. He, he And he plays it so great. There's a few actors in this movie that made me always want to check out other things that they've done. But unfortunately, I always forget to ever, like look it up and go watch uh, other movies with them. He he should be one. He's fantastic in anything I've ever seen him in. So we cut to a boardroom now where we see Peter Gallagher barging in and he asks the room if they have located an heir yet. They're all waiting on pins and needles for the results to come over the fax machine. <laughs> this was funny to me and I don't know if it was supposed to be but it was absolutely hysterical to me that they are just waiting to rip that page off the fax every time something comes over so a fax comes in and it says Longfellow Deeds Mandrake Falls New Hampshire big bold letters like that's all it says and again that was funny to me I was like really that's that's the fax you said big bold letters of his name (laughs) the question I have is did you laugh at the joke with the first fax that came in with the guy from his doctor with the spastic colon. Did that nope. joke make you laugh? You didn't laugh at that joke. 
that didn't land for me yeah i kind of okay. groaned i was like oh okay that that made me laugh but it, oh, it made me laugh because what sells it is that actor that actor plays that role really like he's trying to be silly but also sophisticated at the same time oh cecil chuck's like right hand man he's like lead counsel for the company or something again unclear for quite a while eric avari is the actor and yeah he's absolutely hilarious in this his facial expressions it kind of feels like that's what made this movie so entertaining to me is that because i see what you're saying like now thinking back on it it's not adam sandler's best performance but it's like he brings out something in the people around him like all the characters around him are actually very entertaining and i enjoy them well the thing about this film as far as they bill it as a rom-com i thought it was a rom-com going in and there's very little romance to none. Uh, Winona Ryder and Adam Sandler, to me, don't have chemistry. And then the comedy, if, if the beats don't hit, if the comedy's not for you, this movie just plays out mean and dark and not very fun to watch. So you've really got to find these beats funny <laughs> or else this is not a good watch. <laughs> Interesting. I, I, I'm very curious now, anyone listening to this who watches it, if anyone's going to pick up on that, find it mean and dark, or did we just get a glimpse into your soul? No, it, ve it very <laughs> much is, is mean and dark because it's not fun. I mean, unless you're laughing at the jokes. So now we are watching a plane land at an airfield, like just in the middle of bumfuck nowhere. And we see Peter Dante and he was in Turkeyverse Connection, Strange Wilderness. He's in most Adam Sandler movies, right? Yes. And he plays this town bumpkin guy that lives in this town. I don't find him particularly funny in this film, which was a shame to me because I find him delightful in other Adam Sandler movies. And even in uh, the one he does with Alan Covert, Grandma's Boy, when he's fucking talking to the monkey and shit in that movie. Yeah, this, this is probably the worst I've ever seen him. Like this, this is a character that did not that did not even hit for me. And I like I said, I enjoy this film, but that character was just kind of like, eh. When I first saw it, it was like it might have been a little bit better. But like once you see the other stuff that he's done, like what he's capable of, then you go back and watch this, you're like, oh, dude, you really just you did not have a good role in this movie. And I would attribute that honestly to the writing because they don't give him shit to do except just be the mo the town moron basically. And it, I don't know, it just doesn't come across. Doesn't hit for me. Yeah, it, it was like there's a few Adam Sandler regulars that it feels like they just dropped the ball uh, having them just do like little little cameos in this and you hardly ever see them. Like you should have seen them a lot more in this movie because a lot of the times that's what makes an Adam Sandler movie is some of the regular characters he has. The, the ensemble films. around him. Yeah. yeah. So they go round and round here about what Deeds' first name is because this guy is genuinely shocked to find out it's Longfellow. <laughs> and then he says he can take them to see him so off they go so the man takes chuck and cecil to a local pizzeria in a small town and he tells them that deeds owns the pizza place and lives above it then a woman comes over and i got total mystic pizza flashbacks because this is the amazing conchata Farrell playing the manager of the pizza parlor jan and again turkey verse connection because she is aunt dorothy in Krampus. Oh, that's right. I always think of her from um, Two and a Half Men, right? Yes. That's what I was thinking, which is hilarious because I don't even like that show. But I used to see like like when I was working at uh, a job in the break room, that show was always on because people would watch it. And so I would always see her and like, oh, she's funny. I think I remember her from somewhere. <laughs> yep. Us old chicks remember her from Mystic Pizza, which she's fucking awesome in. But then, of course, Krampus. She's just a good comedic actress to me because she can be the straight person. Like she can deliver hilarious lines and keep a complete straight face. It's like I said, it's like that's what kind of made this movie for me was that he brought in, uh, I don't know if it was him, the casting director, whoever, brought in a lot of good actors to play good side characters. And that yeah. kind of helped like fill out the warmth for me. Uh, apparently you didn't get that. Um, Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so she looks over at, uh, what the hell is Dante's character's name in this? Um, Murph. Murph. So she looks over at Murph and she's like, well, uh, Deeds is out right now making deliveries because Murph called in sick today. And she looks at him like, you don't look sick to me. <laughs> 
you want more out of you want more out of him. Like he's just he just deserves such a better role. He plays well, dumb characters so well. I fully expected him to like fake a cough and limp off or something stupid, and he didn't do any of that. He's just like, oh, you got me. <laughs> I'm like what? She's like, yeah, put on an apron and help me out. Get in here. So they ask the woman if she's Mrs. Deeds. And she laughs and says, no, he's never even dated. And I'm like, first time watch, really? This average to sort of good looking dude owns a business, lives in a small town and is probably what, 30s? And he's never dated. Are you kidding me? Just weird. Weird to me. Weird weird thing to put in there. Yeah, I'm I'm not going to disagree with you. I always thought that was kind of odd too. And it would have made it a little bit more interesting if there would have been like a tragic romantic backstory of like, oh, he dated somebody, she broke his heart. So he's like, I'm not going to date anymore. I I mean, it's it's a trope for a reason because it works in those kinds of movies. Yeah, That would have been a nice addition. She points out that he'll be back soon because it's greeting card day and he never misses greeting card day. There's a bulletin board with a whole bunch of like handwritten cards um, or are or, or they're taped to a wall or something inside this pizzeria deeds comes in and he's going to go over and choose a card because everyone's cheering him on everyone wants to hear him read his card they're all there for it so he goes and picks a card he's saying that he hopes one day he'll get published hallmark will buy one of his cards i guess back in the early 2000s you could randomly submit like that it just seems odd to me <laughs> for a dream for him to have it's like you own a pizzeria yeah I, like there, there's little aspects of this film that are just kind of dumb like yeah like of all the things a hallmark greeting card like a hallmark card writer that doesn't seem like a dream that's if anything you think like why don't you want to take your pizzeria to become like Domino's or something yeah well i guess it's supposed to add to the fact that he's such a uh innocent sweet kind bumpkin kind of guy it's like oh he wants to write mushy greeting cards isn't he sweet you know so the one he reads out loud is To my sweetheart, I love you completely with all my soul. Without you, I'm nothing. A butterless roll. (laughs) And the picture on this card is supposed to be a roll with like heat waves coming off of it. It looks like a turd, like a smelly (laughs) turd. (laughs) Uh, I, I mean, they did a good job in the fact that it's supposed to be a campy, dumb card. So they, yes. they nailed it on that, but it, it is like, oh, that is pretty stupid. Um, yeah. And they all encourage him. I cannot remember the name of the character. Uh, it always, I mean, like every time I watch it, because he's such, he only appears like once or twice in the entire movie very briefly. But the guy dressed as a cop, do you remember him? Yeah, the one who's who's asking him to read the greeting card. It, Deed says to him, why are you dressed like a cop? You're, you're not even a cop. And he's like, oh, I got a good deal at the costume shop. <laughs> is it what? just me? I mean, like, that's not the guy from strange wilderness and uh the broken lizards group is it because it no. looks like him no that's not the same guy okay i i, I can i can never tell i always mean to look it up like i'm not crazy like that legitimately looks like a skinnier version of him right well to me he looks like a skinny like a chris penn maybe okay maybe that's bit. who i'm thinking of but he just he reminds me of something i always thought it was that guy for a long long time <laughs> So in the middle of all this, Chuck and Cecil uh, are approaching Deeds and saying, you know, uh, do do you recognize the name Blake? And he says, that was my mom's maiden name. Sure. And they're like, well, you had a great uncle and he died and left you a $40 billion media company. And Deeds is not phased by this at all. He's like, oh, cool. (laughs) Um, Okay. So then he gets on his stage and reads out loud. A 50th anniversary card for everybody. 50 years have passed by with laughter and tears. Do you remember when we went (laughs) to the zoo and that time we drank all the beers? (laughs) I promise to love you for 50 years more, even when your bosoms sag down to the floor. (laughs) Now I'm laughing now. Because it's so stupid. But when he was reading it during I'm I'm watching, I didn't find it funny at all. I was like, oh, that's bad. (laughs) It's yeah, it's not funny. Like, it's funny because it's bad. But it's a good sentiment, though. I mean, like, I assume like every woman would want to hear that, that, you know, no matter who who you are, we're going to love you even when you're when your tits hit the floor. (laughs) I guess I didn't find it funny because I am a woman and we try very hard for our tits not to sag to the floor. So... Yeah, a little offensive. (laughs) 
But everyone cheers and laughs. And one guy's even crying. They show him like has <laughs> a tear running down his face. So stupid. So then Deeds carries some pizzas out and the men follow. And Chuck is saying that you won't be delivering pizzas anymore because you're rich now. They drop one off to these three little old ladies sitting on a bench outside. And there's this really funny, cute exchange between Cecil and one of the ladies. Her name is Cecil. Kitty. This was genuinely cute. And I got a chuckle out of it. No, I, I love that scene with the little, the, I can't even do it, but the little like cat meow growl thing like that that was kind of cool when cecil did that oh it was adorable and then chuck looks at him and goes keep it in your pants <laughs> dude fuck off he clearly needs a woman in his life to soften him that chuck boy he's a bit of a prick he does but i mean peter gallagher that's another man that like i i like i like him he's a really good actor and he does play good villains oh my favorite role of his was while you were sleeping because he just has to lay there in a coma the whole time. <laughs> I take it you don't like him then. He's okay. I, I I remember him on, like, I think one of my favorite roles of his was uh, he did a couple of episodes of a show called Covert Affairs. And I really liked that show for a long time. And he was in that and that was really And then he was also in Rescue Me uh, with Dennis Leary. He played uh, a couple parts in that. And like what he wants to, he can do a really good job. Yeah. So they walk off and Deeds asks, why am I the heir? Chuck explains, you're the only living relative and we need you to come to New York for a few days and sign some papers and you will inherit the 300 million shares of Blake Media, uh, $40 billion, uh, and we'll buy you out. You'll be a billionaire. And then he stops at this jail and that the the jail is open to the street. Like it, there's an opening with bars and he can slide a pizza through to one of the guys in jail <laughs> which i thought was just weird in itself but then we find out the guy is crazy eyes and that's steve buscemi <laughs> with these funky eyeball contact things in that make his eyes look two different directions yes <laughs> buscemi is funny and he's not in this hardly at all which is a shame yeah that, that's another character i wanted so much more of because every scene he's in is is actually hilarious and he's so excited because he brought him a custom pizza, French fries and Oreos. <laughs> like something I, Michelangelo would order. I uh, <laughs> The turtle. I honestly was like, that doesn't sound awful. Cheese, pepperoni, chocolate, French fries. Like, I might try that. <laughs> I, I mean, you've got me until the Oreo part. Chocolate? No. Like, that's the part that does not work for me. The French fries would be interesting, though. So again... Not in this enough because they give him what to me was a fucking hysterical line to say. He said he tr he's in jail because he tried to bite the mailman because he thought he was a wizard trying to cast a spell on him by waving at him. <laughs> oh my God, it's so uh. funny. It's one of the <laughs> stupidest things ever. But the fact that he looks the way he looks and delivering that line and doing the sad little wave, I was crying. I was laughing so much. I, I love him in anything him and Sandler do together. Like, like he always shows up in a Sandler movie in these stupid character roles. And you're like, this man is like a great actor and he has no right doing these movies, but he's great in them. Well, you see him do Oscar caliber performances like Fargo. And then you see him do the most crazy bonkers shit ever in Sandler movies. And he does everything in between. Yeah. It, it, I mean, that show like a... Miracle Workers is so good because he's on it. Yeah, I, that's that's a show that I've I've yet to see, but I want to watch because of him. So Deed says, fine, I'll go with you. I just need an hour to pack. And so he's the first guy. He's the first guy to leave their town in a long time. So when they get to the airport, it everyone's there. And in an hour's span of time, they've all had time to make signs, big signs that say, we love you, Deeds. We'll miss you. And they're all holding signs and cheering as he's boarding the helicopter. It's like, really? Really? Well, I mean, come on, this town is basically Mayberry. So, like, what else do they have to do in this town? <laughs> High school band is there. <laughs> yeah. So they take off and head to New York City. We cut in New York City and see this nasty journalist guy from Inside Access yelling at his staff because they don't have nary a detail on who Blake's heir is. And he is pissed that they aren't breaking the story. So a guy, Marty, speaks up. And this is Alan Covert, again, Strange Wilderness, Turkey vs. Tie, and he's in pretty much every Adam Sandler movie. 
I believe he's the one that always plays three second Tom and all the like uh, the ones with Drew Barrymore. I'm not uh, sure. Uh, well, I don't know, all, but I, I think like in in Fifty First Dates, and then I believe he showed up again in Blended. The guy who keeps losing his his memory. I believe that's him. Well, I love him in other stuff. Like I yeah. said, he was the lead in Grandma's Boy. He did a good job in this too. Like I I, I did not realize that was him the first few times watching the movie until later that I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Well, because his hair in this is awful. It's this weird, bright orange, howdy-doody-looking little perm situation he's got going on. And <laughs> it was like, what? Is that a wig? Like, I don't even know. <laughs> so he comes running in with news that the helicopter from Blake has gone off to Mandrake Falls and is now on its way back with a male passenger who's got to be the new Blake heir. So everyone gets real excited. We cut to a random Wendy's fast food restaurant somewhere in Connecticut. <laughs> and then we cut to on the helicopter. Everybody's eating Wendy's, Frosties, slurping down Frosties, the whole, the whole bit. Cecil, especially, is very much enjoying his Frosty. <laughs> I'm not a huge Wendy's fan, but like one of the few things I actually love about Wendy's is Frosties. I will smack the hell out of anybody to get a Frosty. Oh, agreed. It's not what would you do for a Klondike bar. It's what would you do for a Wendy's Frosty. <laughs> exactly. So back at the uh, news station there, I, I hate to call it a news station. It's a tabloid, really. Babe, the woman from earlier that I thought was the assistant, has missed the staff meeting, confesses to Marty she has zero leads, even though she wants to be the one to break this story on the air. And she's out of money now after spending her substantial paychecks good size paychecks all on shoes so she's sleeping in the office she's broke i don't like her character because from minute one this is her angle she's desperate she makes poor choices she clearly doesn't pay her rent because she'd rather have shoes i can't get on board with her character from minute one i cannot i can understand why i think because this is I... our introduction to her yeah, and it, I think the reason I do enjoy her so much is because I do love Winona Ryder. So I'm talking about that, the character. Yeah, so it's like that's the thing. Is like for me, I just see Winona Ryder, and I'm like, oh, I don't care. I just love Winona Ryder. So <laughs> the character gets a pass for me because of that. But I can see what you're saying because even like the name Babe Bennett is a terrible name for a character. I don't like yeah. that name as a romantic lead in a movie. Like they don't have the greatest chemistry, like you said, but. I give it a pass because I love I love me some Winona. So we cut to the helicopter ride again, and we learn that Deeds actually owns the Jets NFL football team now because it was Blake was the owner. He banter's with the pilots about it. Then Chuck and Cecil discuss how they are going to get Deeds to sign over his shares no matter what. And you're like, ooh, this Chuck is a scumbag <laughs> he's terrible before we go any further i do i know you know me i'm not a sports fan i i not especially football not a football fan but i do love the banter between him and the pilot when he's talking shit about the jets and how yeah. they're gonna, like the pats are gonna kick their ass and he's like oh damn i own the jets i hope they don't face the pats <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's great like i can see a lot of people who own sports teams thinking that like ooh, that sucks so Deeds then breaks into song with a banana for a microphone because <laughs> he's looking out the window and he's in awe that they're up in the sky at night. He starts singing some lyrics from Space Oddity by David Bowie and the pilots join in with him. And then even Cecil joins in for this bit, which is funny until Chuck, the party pooper, shuts it all down. He wants some of his shares. If I got Preston Blake to trust me with his company, I can get this moron to do the same. I mean, look at him. This is Major Tom to ground control. I'm stepping through the door. And, and I'm floating in a most peculiar way. And the stars look very different today. Oh, here am I sitting in a tin can. That's right, Anderson. Far above the world, planet Earth is blue, and there's nothing I can do. I love when Cecil joins in because it's like they're all everyone else is singing 
terribly. And then Cecil comes in with like trying to sing like almost like operatic. And you're like, yeah, what the hell are you doing? I have to admit, it made me laugh. I was like, oh, I love this guy. <laughs> so they land at the top of a giant skyscraper with a big B on the side of it for Blake. They exit the helicopter. Cecil tells Deeds he's the most eligible bachelor in New York now. And Deeds says, well, my parents met when my dad saved my mom, who was ice skating or figure skating, and she fell through the ice and he saved her. And I always thought that I'd meet somebody like that, like a lady in distress. And that's how I would meet my wife the same way. And then we see Marty is off to the side overhearing all of this why are you smiling (laughs) the way he he just like every scene he's in he steals it because he looks ridiculous (laughs) you can't help but see like every scene he just looks so stupid so then a man snaps a flash photograph of deeds and security runs after him he leaps off the roof and a parachute opens and off he goes (laughs) deeds is like hey he he deserves, he, the, yeah, Chuck says something about he should have get his throat cut Yeah, for doing that or something. And I was like, yeah. oh, that's that's dark. Yeah. And like, that, like that... well, he deserves the payday because of his James Bond moves there that he just did. <laughs> and I agree with Deeds. Like, if, if I was in that position and someone did that to get a picture of me, I'd be like, yeah. I was like, not only do you get the picture, but I want to know who you are. I'm taking your ass out for dinner, drinks, because, like, you... Like Good that job. Is some, yeah, that is some spy level, like you said, James Bond level shit. <laughs> but again, with the whole dark, weird shit, he shouldn't get $100,000 for that photo. He should get his throat slit. And I'm like, Whoa. <laughs> that escalated quickly, Chuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, sometimes I kind of felt like Chuck was like going like, you know, super villain level bad guy or something. <laughs> yeah, it was very odd and very dark. So Deeds now gets escorted into the building where the apartment is, and they go down to the apartment. He's greeted in the lobby by Emilio, Preston's butler, and this is John Turturro, <laughs> who I love in this movie. Oh, and, and like, like from the moment he shows up, he's just got this charm. <laughs> okay, so he is playing somebody who is Spanish, of Spanish descent, yeah. and so he pronounces... The V in very, like B, Betty. I'm Betty, Betty Sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> because he sneaks up on Deeds and startles him. And Deeds is like, oh, you snuck up on me. And he immediately just goes, I'm Betty, Betty Sneaky, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I watched that. I backed it up and backed it up like three or four times because I was giggling like an idiot. John Totoro, he had me from minute one in this. I'm Betty Betty Sneaky, sir. (laughs) And the little smirk that he has when he says it. Oh, yeah. No, like he deserved an Oscar for that role. He really did because he's so good. And Deeds is like, well, I don't need a butler. I don't need somebody to do that. So let's just be friends and hugs him. (laughs) (laughs) And then Deeds goes into the elevator and hugs the attendant in the elevator. And I had to double look. I was like, oh, that's that's DB Smooth. Like, what? (laughs) he's in this too but just for a minute jb smooth yeah jb smooth oh jb smooth sorry sorry yeah and and it's a young jb smooth too like like i forgot like he was even a young man at all like i thought he was just born (laughs) old (laughs) he's one of those guys that's born old exactly so we see after he goes in the elevator we cut to chuck telling emilio in a very sinister tone to keep an eye on deeds so it's like oh emilio's working for him okay got it So then we cut to the elevator ride back and Deeds is asking, how's the elevator business to the guy? (laughs) And he goes, it has its ups and downs. And then they both start busting out like that's the funniest fucking thing anybody has ever said in the history of time. Okay, calm, calm down. Cool, cool your tits. That, that, that's not a bad joke. Okay. But (laughs) what makes it to me is the fact that like he knows it's a bad joke and he's waiting for the response to be like, is is Deeds going to laugh? Or is he going to, like, give me shit over it? And that look on his face. That's true. So this is where my uncle lives? Yes, Ah. sir. For the last 35 years of his astonishing life. Oh, you kind of snuck up on me then. I am very, very sneaky, sir. I see that. My name's Deeds. I am Emilio, sir. I am your servant. Servant? I don't want a servant, but you want to be my friend? I'll take that. (laughs) Yes. Good friends. Would you like to go down to your apartment, sir? 
I'm sure it's been an exhausting day. That okay with you, Chuck? Oh, you'll be safe there. It'll take us a couple of days to get the papers drawn up for you to sign. And go make yourself at home. Terrific. Later. I will be with you shortly, sir. You got it. Hey, nice to meet you. I'm Deeds. Uh, I'm Ruben, sir. This is a wicked nice elevator. Keep an eye on him, Emilio. Or it's your ass. It's nice to see you too, sir. So how's the elevator business treating you, Ruben? Oh, it has its ups and downs. All right, all right. <laughs> Jeez, I'm How'd you get down here so fast? Sneaky, sneaky, sir. Right this way. Everybody loves a good ghost story. From the renowned haunting of the Amityville Horror House to the lesser-known curse of the Bassano Vase, legends of the ghostly and macabre have been fascinating and frightening us for centuries. But have you ever wondered if there's any truth behind the lore? Over the last eight years that I've spent as a paranormal researcher, I have constantly asked one important question. Is this a hoax, or could it truly be a haunt? I'm Courtney Hayes, host of the podcast Haunts, where every week I dissect another ghostly legend in an effort to find the truth that lies within. Listen to Haunts for free on your favorite podcasting app and help me to unveil the unknown. Nothing over $3 right now on the website trulyuniquejewelry.com. The website is now clearing out all of their inventory to make room for the new. Nothing over $3. Everything from necklaces, rosaries, rings, earrings, bracelets, extra extender chains, earring backs, every little thing you would need for your jewelry box, including gift boxes, all on clearance prices. So hop on over to trulyuniquejewelry.com. That's T-R-U-L-Y-Y-O-U n-i-q-u-e jewelry.com it's one flat rate for shipping so fill that box or envelope as full as you can with everything on the website priced under three dollars that's truly unique jewelry.com and now back to the show so they get into this uh, this apartment now and the place is huge so deeds gets the staff there to join in the yelling with him he's doing like for echo he's impressed by the echo in this place because it's so big <laughs> And they all start joining in and making noises and echo, echo and all this. It's pretty funny, actually. Especially with the little old man. Yes, it's it's really capped off by that little old guy. <laughs> He's like so delighted to be joining in the shenanigans. It's so cute. It is. It's like it's like no one's ever paid attention to him a day in his life. And he's like, he reminds me of like a puppy that finally got an owner. <laughs> <laughs> So then we cut to Babe asleep in her office, getting a tabloid thrown in her lap by her asshole boss with a picture of Deeds on the cover and asks her, are you going to let them take your story? And that's all that's all that scene is. Then we cut away. So again, first time watch, I'm going, is she a reporter for them? What do you mean? Are they going to take your story? What? Also, what does he care? Who brings him the story as long as he gets the story first? Why does he care if it's her? Who does it like it was just weird yeah I, I, you know now that i think about it it does seem like there was there was a little too much competition over it like okay like that's not going to ruin anything it's like okay so he got the picture that doesn't mean like said so the story is dead like okay they could still run with it i never caught that until recently so we cut to deeds waking up in an absolutely ridiculous bedroom overly lavish gold-plated everything a giant monogram b on everything a water fountain filled with hawaiian punch a stuffed polar bear like <laughs> this room is crazy you got to admit even you would love to have the water fountain with the hawaiian punch i would <laughs> i mean that, that's that is some cool sh- I, I i was i get jealous of that every time i see that so emilio as he's as as deeds is drinking some of this hawaiian punch pops up literally from nowhere right next to this fountain and he startles deeds he tells deeds he's severely underestimating his sneakiness <laughs> he's betty betty sneaky <laughs> i even love the way he says sneaky like just the, like everything that comes out of his mouth is just gold <laughs> so great so then they go into this whole bit 
which I found out on first time watch matters later. But when I'm watching it for the first time, I was like, who cares? It's this whole bit about his frost bitten foot that's totally black and has no feeling whatsoever in it. It's disgusting. And it's not funny at all. I hated this bit. I beg to differ. I will fight you. You are wrong. This is hilarious. Especially like when he first sees the foot and he's like, he's like, it will haunt my dreams forever. <laughs> so the reaction is awesome. He's funny. Agreed. But I, the foot was just disgusting. Uh, uh, like, like when he, when he, oh, I'm sure you're going to get to it. You want, you want to, you want to take over and get to it when he starts going at it with the foot? Oh no, go for it. Oh, okay. He's like, beating like, at he, it with a fireplace poker, right? Yeah. Like I love that where he's like trying to talk him into it. He's like, no, seriously, go ahead and like, you know, hit the foot. I can't feel anything. Gets the fireplace poker. He starts whacking. And he's, he's like, like, he's, uh, I think even Adam Sandler makes a joke. He's like, chop that wood because he is beating the shit out of the foot and then fucking stabs it. <laughs> So see, I didn't find that funny because even though he can't feel it, you could probably still injure him in some way by nailing his foot to the floor, which is what he does with this poker. He jabs it straight through the foot and pins him to the floor, basically. But that that's what makes it so funny is like, you know, jokes like, okay, so you're one of those people that probably doesn't enjoy Tom and Jerry cartoons or the Three Stooges. No, I do. I very much do. <laughs> I very much do. But again, first time watch. 20 minutes into this movie, this seemed very odd. I'm like, what? what is this bit? Like, But we realize after watching the film, this matters later. First it time does, watching, I'm like, I don't get this at all. It seems out of place. I, I, okay, when we get to it later, I, I don't, like, I kind of see where it fits in a little bit. But at the same time, I'm also a little bit like, eh, I don't know. We'll get to it later, though. Over in the boardroom, Chuck is talking to a group of French people, uh, stockholders, I guess foreign stockholders i don't know unclear which a lot of things in this movie are so deeds comes in asking is there something i should be doing i feel like i should be doing something they get interrupted their conversation when a football player for the jets i'm guessing is who this is unclear comes in and starts ranting and demanding more money deeds punches him because he curses he tells him don't be cursing in front of the ladies and he curses so he punches him and knocks him down little deeds well not really little and i'm saying there's quite tall but this little guy compared to this big football player guy he knocks him down helps him back up and then they sit and have a chat <laughs> about his contract deeds winds up firing the man and tells him you better change your attitude or nobody's going to want to work with you <laughs> It seems it's like there's no one of those jokes that kind of like leads into something. And I, I felt the payoff for this joke was worth it later on when it comes back around. Okay. I thought that that makes it. You seem okay. surprised by the fact that Deeds was able to knock him out. though. Well, yeah. I mean, you think big football player, somebody's going to just get one punch in and knock him to the floor. If I find that improbable, but maybe not. It, I've never been I in mean, a bar fight, so I don't know. I mean, like like a little bit of a boxing fan that I am, you hit the person right and they're going to go down. So the only thing they did wrong there was I think he hit him in the nose, which isn't going to bring him down. But it's like, OK, he's going to like blurred vision. But if you want to hit him in the well, jaw, he split his lip. His lip was bleeding. Was the lip. OK, yeah. But it's like, yeah, that's not going to if you want to hit him in the jaw, then that would have probably knocked him out. Chuck tells Deeds now we have everything under control here. Why don't you go out and enjoy the city? So cut to nighttime. <laughs> a whole day is elapsed he's outside we see babe and marty hatching a plan off in the corner while they wait for deeds to show up and babe's hair is now different and we see that they got rid of that awful black wig she her hair has some blonde in it now and it's shorter so they're trying to figure out a way to make her be in distress so that deeds will come to her aid and she can get an in for the story is it you just didn't like the wig about uh or was it the dark color because usually most people seem to like winona Ryder with dark hair i do too but so that's i was annoyed that they even bothered changing her hair because he doesn't know what she looks like he doesn't know her how would he know if her hair was different she had to change her hair to go undercover why he doesn't know you it Actually, was just a, a weird point. plot point to me like why does that matter it doesn't matter oh. at all I didn't even think about that. And unless maybe it was because that way, like nobody else would recognize her. But see, again, first time watch, I'm watching this going, who would recognize her? 
she's some behind the scenes inside access office person who who would know her from anywhere actually that's a good point even as a reporter it's like it's not she's not an on-air reporter yeah this is what i'm saying to you there were too many things when i'm watching this that kind of didn't make sense and they the movie doesn't give us enough information for me to get into it and enjoy it it was just weird i'm like why does she change her hair who cares if you ruin this movie for me i'm gonna have it out for you i'm not (laughs) (laughs) ruining. hey if i couldn't ruin dark man for you every movie should be fine Deeds' limo now pulls up. He gets out and Marty pretends to be mugging Babe. He runs off with her purse. Deeds chases him down and beats the shit out of him with a trash can, kicking him, punching him. Pretty brutal. (laughs) To me, this was a joke that it started out funny, but then the longer it went, it started to become like, ooh, okay, maybe you guys should cut it back a little bit because it, (laughs) it starts to get a little dark. There's that word. I told you. So he green, he grabs the purse, brings it back to babe, uh, helps her up. She says her name is Pam Dawson. And he says, well, I'm, I'm Deeds and I'm not from New York. And they decide to take a little walk and talk for a minute. Deeds asks her to have dinner. So she says, okay. During this walk, he's asking her where she's from. And she makes up this ridiculous name of a town. And here's the other thing I didn't like about her. All the lies that she tells from minute one to him, you can tell on her face, and maybe it's for our benefit, the audience, that she's struggling to come up with these lies. She's like, uh, Iowa? And it's like, is he is he that bad at reading people? He can't tell she's fucking bullshitting him this entire time? Like everything out of her mouth is a lie? Yeah, he did come off as very, very trusting. Uh, very I, naive. Yeah, so, so there was that. Um, I see what you're saying. And I think that is why, like, it's for the comedic purposes and for our benefit to see that she's a terrible liar and that he's yeah. naive enough to fall for it. I did love the name of the of the town, though, with, with uh, Winchester to Fieldville, because it was such a bullshit. Like, you just combined everything that ever made up a town name into one name. I was like, he bought that, really? <laughs> they go into this restaurant and a table of... I guess influential business people, again, unclear, recognize who Deeds is and they arrange to meet him. So Deeds and Babe join their table and we get some silly dialogue back and forth here. And through all of this, we learn what an out of touch bumpkin Deeds actually is. He's not in touch with anything in business, entertainment, the New York scene, like none of it. Here's another thing that irritated me. So I looked on a map because I had to know when he started saying the word wicked all the time, like he's from Boston. That's wicked, awesome, wicked, this, wicked, that. He doesn't do it in the first 20 minutes of the movie. When we go to his hometown of Mandrake Falls and we meet all these people, nobody has accents. Nobody says wicked. He doesn't even say wicked. All of a sudden when he's in New York, every other scene, he's throwing the word wicked in there. Well, that's a Boston thing, pretty much, and, and areas surrounding Boston. So I looked up, he's supposed to be from New Hampshire. There's no way that the part of New Hampshire would be even anywhere near Boston that where he would pick that up and always be saying the word wicked. I, I call bullshit on that from looking at a map. Also, again, like I said, they don't throw that in until he gets to New York. Like, why wasn't he saying it in his hometown? Why weren't other people in his hometown saying it? I, I, I see what you're saying. And to counteract, I will throw out this. You are wrong. Uh, Murph does have an accent. He says wicked? Time. No, no one ever says wicked. But Murph does have an accent uh, the entire time, though. He's the only one, though. Yeah, that the, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's the only one. And nobody else ever says wicked. You're right. You're right. But I just had to throw that in there because you had to, like, you know, you had to take this 25-minute session here to explain how the movie was wrong how you had to research it and just like, you know, oh, movie, you did a bad thing. You suck. You're terrible. The writers should be whipped and drug out into the middle of the street and beat with rocks. I said none of that. <laughs> <laughs> I said none of that. Um... But I, thought, I, I did have to throw in there that Murph did have an accent. So these men ask him to recite a greeting card because they think it's so hilarious that he writes greeting cards. And he falls for it because he's so naive. And it says, he, he says off the top of his head, he's going to try to remember it. It goes, Mom, you are the one who brought me to planet Earth. You are the one who suffered through my 14-hour birth. 
you are the one who made lemonade for me after I'd come back from play. I love you, mom. So have a wicked nice Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. That's not terrible. Why would you think Hallmark would buy such a specific card? Not everybody had a 14 hour labor to have their child. (laughs) It's so specific. I mean, it's very specific, but it wasn't terrible. They make fun of him <laughs> and laugh at it. Okay, he then... that, that, that I do have a problem with. Like, I, I One of the things that irritated me with this movie was they really do portray New Yorkers as complete assholes. <laughs> Doesn't everything usually? Usually, yes. But it's like this one really makes them look like assholes. Which I, if, if there's anyone listening who's from New York, I'm curious. Do you take offense to being portrayed as an asshole in 90% of media in Hollywood? Or do you wear it like a badge of honor? Yeah, that's the yeah. If, if you wear it like a badge of honor, that's awesome. I'd love to know. Yeah. Please write to us and let us know. He lectures them now on manners. As he and Babe are leaving, he says to her, if you weren't here, I'd bash some heads. And she's like, oh, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes and gets aggressive. He goes over the top because he punches one guy and you're like, okay, good for you. Then he takes another man and slams his head on the table. Then he pushes the opera singer so hard that he falls back and crashes on this other table. It's it's so aggressive. It was out of character for me that he's supposed to be this sweet, mild-mannered, naive guy. But then he's going to just pound everybody around him that looks at him funny. I was like, what? To me, the only reason it bothered me is because of what happens like towards the end of the film. That's where it kind of gets a little bit like, okay, you're 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 kind of teasing, like he's got a little bit of a temper, he's gonna beat some people up if they pick on him, or if they kind of do him wrong or whatever. So this is obviously leading towards something, right? Movie, you're setting us up for something. Okay, got it. Exactly. So Babe then goes to the restroom and we see that she's got a hidden camera in her shirt, in her bra. Deeds gives a stack of cash, he says it's $20,000, to a restaurant staff and apologizes for the mess. This should take care of it. Who's carrying around a stack of $20,000 in cash, first of all? <laughs> Deeds is naive, so he's probably got a stack of, you know, but it, but it does where make did you he wonder. Where is he, yeah, I was going to say, where is he keeping it at? He's got no, like, those pockets are going to be bulging with money. So there, there's, he's got a hidden pocket somewhere. But also, where did he get it? Like, he's he hasn't sold the company yet, like his shares. I, I don't know. Well, he, he so, still has all that money. So maybe like they could have given him walking around money. You're probably right. That's probably just, yeah, they gave him walking around money, but he blows the whole wad. So he meets John McEnroe, the tennis legend, who is famous for having a temper and being a bit of a dick in the lobby here. He introduces himself and invites Deeds and Babe for a night on the town. Cut to Deeds waking up in bed hungover when Emilio shows up. Every time his name was said, all I can hear is Will Ferrell in my head from Night at the Roxbury going, Emilio! (laughs) The breakfast (laughs) clubber himself. So he shows up bedside with aspirin and some water. He tells Deeds he made sure Miss Dawson got home okay last night. So that's good. Chuck comes barging into the bedroom. Excuse me, sir. Turns on the TV show, the the inside access to show deeds. There's footage of him being drunk and stupid and egging cars with McEnroe. (laughs) That babe got on her boob cam, basically. (laughs) I mean, we got to give babe credit that camera from her boobs was able to get that amazing footage because that is some good camera work. (laughs) it's <laughs> some good footage like, yeah like like her her tips deserve an emmy for that so chuck says this is not the kind of attention that we need right now deed apologizes and hugs chuck <laughs> okay <laughs> emilio pops in and says it's time it's time to go to preston's funeral deed says oh okay i'll go change into my suit and we can get going so chuck is clearly annoyed by this because he was trying to not take deeds to the funeral because he leans in and tells emilio as soon as deeds is gone you're fired he says something about your puerto rican ass is fired or something like that and then when chuck leaves he's all i'm from spain or i'm spanish and he gives him the middle finger and he goes ole (laughs) 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 again more amazing emilio bits (laughs) so we cut to the funeral where Deeds decides to impromptu say a few words. 
after uh, Reverend Al Sharpton gets done rhyming, <laughs> giving his his speech in all rhyme, which was really funny, actually, to me. I, th I think this is the only time I've ever liked anything from Sharpton. What I like in this scene is we get a quick cut of the funerals being televised because, you know, Blake was a big deal. And we see back in the hometown, Murph and Crazy Eyes are watching the TV. And Murph makes a comment about, oh, look, there's Deeds. And Crazy Eyes goes, what? Deeds? I thought we were watching Scooby-Doo. <laughs> <laughs> he can't fucking see it anyway. <laughs> so then Deeds proceeds to recite a poem off the top of his head that he wrote in the car on the way there. He says, you climbed mountains and built skyscrapers. You made a TV show and put out newspapers. You were wicked good at doing stocks. You liked it when Emilio would change your socks. We never have hung out, and that makes me sad. All the good times we could have had. But when I die, Uncle Preston, you better say cheers, because me and you are hanging at the pearly gates, and I'll bring the beers. <laughs> Whatever. Your negativity is killing me here. I mean, like, he's he's trying oh. to be positive, and they're, they're cute little poems. Okay, so, but then we, you have to admit this is a stupid bit. With him opening the casket, and the body pops up, and he's still fucking frozen with the same expression on his face. Your body would still not be frozen. But I, I mean, it's, it's a silly comedy movie. It's supposed to be dumb, but I will, I'll give you that, okay? It was a bit that did not quite work. Even I was like, okay, this one's kind of dumb. I'm glad we can at least agree on one of them. I was like, this is not funny at all. This is painful. <laughs> then we see Babe and her asshole boss watching this on TV. Babe says, well, we've got another date today. And the boss jokes about her being virginal because she's like, oh, Virgin Pam is going out with him. And he's like, yeah, right. You're a virgin. Ha ha ha. And I was like, ooh, as a woman, <laughs> that's stupid. That's not funny. That's not a jab. Like, let's just let that go. So then back at Blake's apartment, Deeds is eating Cocoa Pebbles, which made me want a bowl of cereal real bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then a homeless man, I guess, has come in and he gives him alcohol and an oil painting to take. <laughs> what is this? That was a little odd. Even even for me, I was I was a little confused. Like, OK, and, and like you're going a little overboard with the generosity. That's what I thought that was supposed to be us them showing us how over the top nice he is. And I was like, okay, we get it, movie. This is kind of dumb, like a homeless guy. Okay, if you need to use the toilet, come on back. Like, what? So Emilio tells Deeds here that he got to hang out with Preston almost every day for 30 years. And I thought to myself, he does not look old enough to have been a servant or a butler for 30 years. He looks really good for his age. <laughs> Yeah, that always kind of confused me because I was like, okay, are you saying like, were you there when you were a baby or I, I, it was a little confusing to me on the age because yeah, he doesn't look like he's, he's that old. I, I would say maybe 40. He, he intimates that he grew up there around him, but it's like, how long were you actually his butler for 30 years? Really? Like when you, did you start before you were 20? <laughs> I mean, we don't know what the child labor laws are. Like, it's not like they're in Holland. So he tells Deeds that Preston was a happy guy. And like a father to him, Emilio gets up and vanishes like immediately. And the little music sting that goes with him appearing and reappearing and disappearing is so funny to me. That little bit never got old to me. I was I genuinely chuckled when whenever he would appear or disappear. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason he's the best character in the whole movie. Oh, hands down. Agreed. So Babe calls Deeds, but before he can ask her out, he gets another call. From the Jets quarterback, we now find out that's who that is. And I'm like, oh, okay. Information I would have liked earlier. He says that he's reconsidered Deeds' suggestion that he stay with them and win them a Super Bowl. Like, he doesn't want to be fired, basically. The man's father grabs the phone and starts talking to Deeds. And this guy, this character actor, this is Blake Clark. Again, uh, Strange Wilderness Tie for Turkey Verse. And he, I always remember him as the mumbling Cajun coach from The Water Boy. <laughs> He's been a lot of, uh, he was he was the coach in Grown Ups. Uh, the main thing I remember him from was he played Sean's dad on Boy Meets World. Okay, okay. So they banter back and forth and Deeds tells the man's father that he cursed in front of ladies. 
And so then the dad is super offended to hear that, that that's how his son acted. And he takes his belt off and is going to beat him with the belt. And then the (laughs) phone call hangs up. That's not funny at all. That's like, what the fuck? All right, whatever. You can do your damn impression from fucking Jaws all you want. That shit was funny. (laughs) Especially with the look on his face and the whole... Yeah, with the, that ain't funny. That ain't funny at all. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) I was like, what are you talking about, Jaws? Do not put this movie and that movie in the same sentence, sir. (laughs) Oh, I will, because that that joke hit harder than he got hit with that belt, okay? Because that shit was funny. Oh, a grown man being whooped by his father with a belt. Yes. So we cut back to the phone call with Babe. Deeds asks her out for that night, and she says yes. Cut to later, Deeds is sliding down the banister in his main hall there of the apartment. He breaks a table with his crash landing, and in doing so, finds his great uncle's private journal, his diary, and decides to take it. Okay, so Deeds now pays two, I don't know, 10-year-olds, maybe? 20K each. Big stacks of cash to take their bicycles so that he and Babe can go riding through the park at night. (laughs) These are adult, like, 10 speeds. These are not children's bicycles. It was so weird. I always kind of wondered, like, who did these kids steal those bikes from? Because, (laughs) I mean, it's New York. It's the middle of the night. These kids are out riding bikes. Everything about this scene seems a little sketchy. So they ride through this park. And then they go down these giant flights of stairs and they stop at a fountain with nobody around, which made me question what time of night is this that there's nobody in the park in New York? And then as they're sitting there chatting, you do see one couple walk past behind them. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe it's not too late. (laughs) So Babe tells Deeds more lies about the fake place she grew up. Just keeps piling them on, lie after lie. The house she grew up in describes it, this whole big thing. And Deeds tells her that he read some of his great uncle's journal on the way over. And at nine years old, he wanted to be in radio. So Babe says when she was little, she always wanted to be a news reporter. And then it clicked in my head, okay, so she's a reporter behind the scenes for this Inside Access show. Got it. Until this point, the movie had not spelled that out for us very well. (laughs) But now I'm like, oh, okay, got it. So fire trucks now go whizzing by. Deed says, oh, we've got to go. We've got to go help. And they hop on their bicycles and take off. And I'm like, what? It's because when he was little, he always wanted to be a fireman, he says. So he's obsessed with fire trucks. Okay, (laughs) off they go. So now for the next three and a half, four solid minutes of film time, We are subjected to the most ludicrous cat rescuing deeds scales this building that's on fire to save this lady and her seven cats. That's all I wrote about that scene. I did not write any of it in detail. So if you want to touch on anything that tickled your funny bone in this scene, go for it. (laughs) I will I will give you uh, up until the cats. The scene is ridiculous. The climbing up. Okay, that's it's, it's dumb. Once the cats get on the screen, I'm laughing. I don't care who you are. If you're not laughing, you have no business being in my life because when there's cats flowing out of the building and doing silly shit, it is hilarious. The uh, cats are it. in peril and you're a cat person. This didn't upset yeah. you or bother no, you? No, no, because I'm an One intelligent- of them is on fire. I, I am an intelligent adult who can understand the well... difference between fucking <laughs> fiction and reality. I'm not going to get on here and be like, oh my God, these cats are dying. No, it's a fucking movie. I understand the difference. So it's hilarious to me. And plus we get Rob Schneider coming back from his playing his character from Big Daddy. That I thought was that great. too. I was waiting yeah, for him it, to be like hip hop anonymous. <laughs> yeah. it, it, uh, so that, that was a cool little cameo. I, I could have swore though. And I maybe you thought the same thing. I thought there was going to be a terrible joke when the cat landed in his food. There was going to be a joke about him, like, basically eating the cat or something. Well, it's PG-13. They had to draw the line somewhere. 
<laughs> yeah, like I, I would not be surprised if like in the original script somewhere, like there is a post-it note of like, yeah, we were going to have that joke, but we couldn't put it in there. But I, I so, love the cat scene. This lady won't leave her apartment because all her cats will die in the fire if she doesn't save them. So he helps her round up all the cats, even one that's on fire. They all get tossed out the window at various times and various things happen to them. I found not one bit of it funny. I'm not even a cat person and I still didn't find it funny. Like that they were all in danger and one was on fire. I was like, how is this funny? <laughs> that was funny. I, I mean, it was stupid, especially like the cat landing and the and the, the black guy's afro was like, okay, come on. You're going, you're going a little too stereotypical here and it's a little dumb, but I still enjoyed it. I thought, I thought it made me laugh and the cats were freaking adorable. So after all these cats get rescued, the lady and Deeds fall out the window together to bounce on the uh safety i don't know trampoline Tramp that they have for yeah, her <laughs> I, have, I have no idea what that thing is called they bounce off of it land on the street but they're fine so babe sees that the footage she took of all of this happening which she is enjoying when it's happening by the way she's very enamored with deeds like oh he's doing this heroic thing he's so sweet but she's also making sure to get all the footage she sees later that the footage was edited and chopped up to make deeds look like a cat killer <laughs> that he was purposely trying to hurt the cats and the woman. I found that stupid because there were hundreds of eyewitnesses that could tell you otherwise, that that is not what happened. It was dumb. On top of the but, fact of like, if, if we're going to throw in logic, which this is you were talking about, so there's going to be logic thrown in here. There should have been other news stations and reporters showing up to capture this story. So it's like, yeah, this would not be the only story out there on Deeds doing this. So that that was a little bit like, eh, okay. She confronts her boss right there and says he was very heroic. And her asshole boss tells her that uh, the more depraved and insane he looks, the better for them. And she better keep getting footage. She tells Marty... Deeds is a very sweet guy and doesn't, I don't know if I can keep doing this, she says. I, I don't know. Marty says, well, he can't be that sweet because he beat the shit out of me. <laughs> and he still has bruises and like his arm is in a sling and like all this shit because he was pretty beat down. He also adds, no one is as good a guy as Deeds is clearly pretending to be. And he calls, De uh, he calls Babe a sucker for buying it. Now... I get he's cynical New Yorker guy, but the fact that you're going to say nobody, not one single person out of however many billions of people are on this planet are actually a good person. Really, bro? I, I think that's coming not just from the cynical New York thing. I think that's also because I don't know about you, but I always get the vibe that he's interested in her. He wants to hook up with her but she just doesn't see him in that way. So. so so I wasn't getting that until this scene. Yeah, this scene, uh, she says he doesn't deserve this. And she takes the camera out of her bra and drops it on his lap and walks away. And he holds the camera up and sniffs it because it was in her shirt. And I was like, this fucking creepo likes her. <laughs> First off, that that yeah, that's a little disgusting, a little creepy. Which I didn't like because up until this point, he was just coming off as like, okay, he's dumb, but he's not like overly creepy. And that was like, eh, again, I hate to bring this word up, but that was kind of dark and creepy. I'm curious, like, why do people do that? Like, why are they like, oh, okay, they always do that with the, oh, I'm going to sniff something of yours. I'm going to sniff this, is, this has been in your, your shoe or whatever. Why do you want to sniff body odor? <laughs> You're asking the wrong person because that, thoroughly disgusts me i am so grossed out by that i i don't i don't understand it like that's that so the let's, let, let's put it out to the listeners listeners if yeah. you're the kind of person that likes to sniff other people's shoes please write to us and let us know what the appeal is no i'm kidding i'm kidding do no. not no, do no. not write to us about that please do not write to us i don't want to know that <laughs> I'm very All curious right. now. Like, what is the appeal? So we now see Deeds is on his computer messaging instant messenger back and forth with Jan, who's sitting at the pizzeria on her computer. She tells him don't do anything crazy because he's so upset about the story. And then she says, you know what? Let's just focus on that girl. Tell me about that girl you've been seeing. We cut to Chuck and Deeds now playing tennis. And Deeds tells Chuck that he knows tennis was his uncle's favorite game because he read it in his journal, in his diary. 
And for a second here, I was like, Ooh, don't say that because then you're going to, you know, Chuck is going to think something nefarious and like want to get his hands on that journal or, you know, like don't tell him you have the journal is what I was thinking first time watch, but it doesn't come to anything with that. (laughs) That was a plot point that seemed like it was dropped. They could have went so much further with that and they they just let it go. It, It was, it was weird. Um, Okay, I got to go back a little bit. Did you, I know you didn't laugh at it. I have to know though, how hard did you not laugh at Murph when he pretended to be, when he pretended to be Jan on the computer and he wrote the message to Deed, get that hot, I forget what, what the message was, but like basically saying like, you know, go hit that. Oh, go hit that hot piece of ass or something like that. He's laughing because he goes to Jan. Oh, he's going to think you wrote that. <laughs> yeah, no, it was not funny at all. It was bro humor. There, there was, I got to admit, there were several times watching this that I was like, she's not going to laugh at that. She's not going to laugh at that. Ooh, she's not going to like that. <laughs> I love that you know me so well, though. You knew I was going to be like, mm-mm. <laughs> I, I, I knew going in that this movie was going to be painful for you. I just knew you were not going <laughs> to like it. So we'll see now that uh, on the tennis court here, the ball boy is, in fact, Marty in disguise. <laughs> And a a terrible wig and these crazy eyebrows that are half hanging off his face. (laughs) They they needed more of him in disguise in this movie. Like he should have just been following deeds the entire time. Almost like a where's Waldo situation. Where's Marty? And he's like shitty just looking disguises. I would have loved if they would have thrown that in there. That might have made it more fun for me to, yeah, to be like, oh, where is he in this scene? Like what disguise is he wearing now? Yeah, They don't lean into it enough. It was almost like they kind of phoned this movie in a little bit. There was a lot of potential for a classic Adam Sandler movie, and they just dropped the ball on so many aspects. Well, we'll get to it later, but they leaned too heavily on keeping aspects of the original when they were writing the script, I think. It didn't leave Uh, room for the classic Adam Sandler humor. So Chuck tells Deeds, you can sign the company papers, sign it over to us tomorrow. Deeds says, you know... Actually, I was thinking about sticking around a while. I'm not in any hurry to sign. He doesn't want to sell his shares right away. He adds that he met a girl who might be the one. Marty then hands a tennis ball to Chuck with a message written on it in Sharpie that says to meet him in the showers. (laughs) I was like, what? That could be taken so wrong. I I was more impressed by the fact that he was able to write so, uh, so well on a tennis ball. I mean, so legibly I could read it. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's impressive. I can barely write in a notepad very legibly. I'm aware. (laughs) (laughs) So Chuck enters the showers and sees Marty naked with his ass to him, soaping and washing his ass. Oh my God. (laughs) I just love, I love that scene because it's so horrible. I mean, it's just so stupid with him washing his ass and like the way he's looking at him as he's watching. (laughs) So what struck me about this is you said, meet me in the showers to have a sneaky, you know, quiet conversation. Why you got to be naked and showering? Why couldn't you just meet him dressed to talk? Because he's an idiot. Because then he turns around and walks over to him naked to talk to him. It's so bizarre. Marty tells Chuck, basically... I can give you info that will make Deeds leave town. Like he'll want to tuck tail and run. I can tell you who who Babe really is, basically is what he's saying. But we don't get any more information than that because they cut the scene right away. It's real short. Well, I mean, did you want to see more of his ass? I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to hear more of their sneaky deal, their dirty deal, but that we don't get it. So then we cut to Babe's boss walking into his office and he finds Chuck waiting for him. Chuck says he'd like to strike a deal, but then we cut away again. So we don't get all the information that he's received from Marty. We don't get all the information of the deal he's making with Chuck. uh, Chuck and the boss. We just have to wait for all of this for later. (laughs) All right, listeners, that is going to wrap up part one of our discussion on Mr. Deeds. Be sure and come back next week for part two when we wrap this film up. In the meantime, if anyone out there is interested in checking this film out, at the time of this recording, it was currently available pay streaming on Amazon Prime and free on Sling TV. So until next time, goodbye. Oh, you kind of snuck up on me then. I am very, very sneaky, sir. I see that. Hey listeners, Movie Miss here saying we know you have a lot of options when it comes to podcasts. So we want to thank you so much for listening to ours. 
Please make sure to find us on our socials and join us. Be part of our bad movie conversations. We want to chat with you. We're on Facebook with an official page, as well as a Let's Talk Turkeys discussion group, where you can talk with other like-minded individuals who like bad movies. We're on Instagram at Let's Talk Turkeys. Our Twitter handle is at Gobble Podcast. That's G-O-B-B-L-E-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. And of course, you can always email us direct. We would love to get suggestions from you of movies you would like us to cover. If you want to be a guest on the show, we would love that. So directly, that's Let's Talk Turkeys, all one word, at yahoo.com. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go. Good job.